Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to our fifth annual Catamount College Connection Program. Our virtual session tonight includes participants from 42 states across the US and from 17 countries. This is a testament to the strength of our global campus community and we are so glad to have you here with us today. My name is Kit Cahill, and I'm a member of the admissions committee for the UVM Alumni Association Board of Directors. On behalf of the UVM Alumni Association and the Office of Admissions, I am thrilled to welcome you tonight. Our mission today is to offer you a behind the scenes look at the college search and application process from some of the best in the business, including our very own UVM Director of Admissions, Moses Murphy. In addition, we aim to provide information, tools, and resources to guide you as you consider your college options and prepare your application materials. We hope you leave this session today feeling empowered, excited, and more confident as you take this next step in your life. The college search and application process can feel overwhelming, but we hope to make that process a little smoother for you today. I vividly remember the nerves that come with applying to college, but I also remember the thrill of an acceptance letter. A long application journey can end in excitement and pride when a college or university selects you. Tonight, we hope you feel more prepared for this process. I am a proud UVM alumna, graduating in 2009 from the College of Arts and Sciences and the Honors College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Anthropology and Sociology. I know many of you here today have parents, grandparents, or other relatives in your family who went to UVM. They are a part of our community of 127,000 catamounts living all around the world. My partner, my sister, and my uncle also went to UVM, so I know how special this extraordinary connection with UVM is. Our work at the UVM Alumni Association focuses on building and growing the vibrant global community that makes up our UVM family. I share this with you because whether you have a connection to UVM or another institution, I encourage you to consider the value of your community, your network, in supporting you in this next chapter in your life. In as little as one year from today, some of you students may be preparing to start your first semester of college. As you consider where you wanna go, what you wanna study, who you wanna be, and where you want your education to take you, I encourage you to lean into those communities and networks of which you are a part. Most importantly, chart your course, make your own story. You create your experience. Be active and engaged learners. To our students in the audience, I know I speak for your parents and families when I say that we are proud of all that you have accomplished. And I hope you find these sessions valuable as you prepare for this next chapter in your life. To all of our guests, thank you for being with us today and making this Catamount College Connection a rich and interactive experience. With that, I will turn the program over to UVM's Director of Admissions, Moses Murphy. Well, thank you, Kit. I hope you know uh, just how much we appreciate uh, all you do for UVM on behalf of the UVM Alumni Association. Uh, as Kit mentioned, my name is Moses Murphy, Director of Undergraduate Admissions here at the University of Vermont, and I'll be serving as your host this evening. I'm happy to do so. You know, we have a, a full program today with 
Lots of expertise packed into a short 90 minutes. So let me first begin uh, by sharing the outline for today's program and to remind you of a few housekeeping items as we go through tonight's uh, activities. Uh, to begin our program, we'll be joined by Dr. Andy Rosenfeld from the Vermont Center for Children, Youth and Families, who will share some thoughts on the, the brain science of happiness as it relates to this specific time in a person's life as they navigate the admissions process. Uh, we'll then have some sessions that will be led out by members of the UVM admissions staff uh, that will feature our, our tips uh, for the application, the essay, financial aid processes. Following that, we're going to have our panel of admissions experts uh, who will answer a variety of often asked admissions questions from a variety of different vantage points. And in fact, Collectively, our esteemed panelists have worked at at least 10 different colleges and universities. So they really come to this event uh, with a vast range of, of knowledge on college admissions. Now, you'll notice that there is a, a Q&A feature as part of our event for those of you joining us to submit a questions. Uh, our admission staff will be monitoring those and we'll begin doing so roughly halfway through the program. I strongly encourage you to, to use this feature as part of the event. It looks like two chat bubbles that are sort of together on your command bar. You know, if you have a question, uh, chances are that someone else in the audience has that exact same question. So I really encourage you to use our admissions team again. Uh, would love, love to answer uh, those questions for you. Um, some of those we'll answer directly, uh, privately in the chat, um, but some of the sort of frequently asked questions that are popping up or will publish, uh, so the answers are there for, for all to see. Uh, so now uh, it's time for some advice from sort of outside of the admissions uh, world uh, from one of our faculty members here at UVM to help frame the, the bigger picture as you embark on this process. I'd like to welcome Dr. Andy Rosenfeld. Dr. Andy Rosenfeld practices family psychiatry at the Vermont Center for Children, Youth and Families. He loves to play with his kids, go for walks. He chairs the quality improvement for the psychiatry department at UVM, and he is privileged to teach positive psychiatry and other topics to undergraduate students through faculty here at the University of Vermont. So with that, Dr. Rosenfeld, please take it away. Thank you, Moses, for that generous introduction. What a privilege to be here with you all. Evening time in Vermont. Um, I'm excited to share. This is what I've done is sort of pull some bite-sized pieces from a course that I get to teach. And as Moses mentioned, I enjoy teaching undergraduates and also students in graduate programs, including at the College of Medicine and uh, folks who are training specifically in psychiatry, the specialty I practice. But I also practice this with patients and families that are making their way through their own strengths and vulnerabilities. And of course, I practice this for myself and my own family, uh, being human like the rest of us. So I hope this will be sort of interesting and apropos of this time where you all are thinking about the exciting and stressful course of uh, college and making choices and applying, which is uh, really an intense time for students and for families. So a great time to reflect on happiness or take a pause for that. And one of the things that I like to emphasize in the class is that defining our terms, what are we talking about when we say science of happiness? And that science is really only one perspective of looking at the world. And it has some particular things to offer by taking our observations about the world, making guesses about them, and then testing them and retesting them through experiments mostly designed to reduce our biases. We all have all sorts of biases, some of which we're aware, some of which are hard to see. And so science is designed to reduce some of those so that we can get at more accurate or valid or reliable predictions. And this has been applied over the last couple of decades more and more to things like happiness. So the term happiness, I don't actually love. It's kind of a sexy thing to put in a course title. Everybody wants to be happy, but it's a little bit of a misnomer because being happy all the time is probably not the best balance for people. There are a lot of other emotions and experiences that are packed into what it takes to have a meaningful life. It's going to vary person to person, but happiness is a draw. Maybe well-being would be a more rounded term. 
And speaking of rounded, this circle here shows some of, what are some of the contributions to our own personal and collective well-being. The science is showing, like many other personality traits, that genetics contributes about 50% to things that we would measure along the lines of happiness, like life satisfaction, quality of life, or overall well-being. And then our circumstances, how much money we have, where we live, which college we go to, contributes a small fraction, maybe 10%. Um, but there's a lot left to ourselves in the diagram, the choices that we make, 40% here. The other new thing in the science, this is the fun thing for me about teaching, is it's always learning. If I'm not learning while I'm teaching, then I'm probably not teaching very well. The 40% affects the 50%. So our genes are being turned on and turned off, activated, deactivated as we go through life, not just by the air we breathe and the water we drink, but by the choices we make what uh, moods we're in, who, with whom we interact, what environments, how much nature we have, how much sleep we have, all those sorts of things. So the 40% is juggling the 50% in terms of not changing the genes, but changing which, which ones are active for us. So there's a lot we can do to affect our happiness. Next slide. Why are we talking about this? In part because we often bump up against these limits. If we want to be happier, if we want to have more well-being, why can't we just have it? So this phenomenon of the hedonic treadmill is to describe when good things happen or when bad things happen, we often gravitate back to this, what they call a hedonic set point. Hedonic from the ancient Greek, meaning something around pleasure or happiness. And it's like going on a treadmill like um, a hamster. <laughs> Uh, spinning the wheel where we can have something wonderful happen like winning the lottery we think we're going to be happier and a few months later if you check in with those folks and measure their happiness again it's about where they started three months prior and also after tragic events people who have lost uh, function in their limbs through an accident their happiness sinks for a bit and you check in with them three months later and they're often pretty close to where they started even though they've had to adjust to a life with different ability than they had before so there's something sticky about our happiness set point where it's hard to veer too far from it. And a little bit of the holy grail in the science of happiness is how could we take that happiness set point and lift it up a little bit and keep it there, not just for a few months, but maybe for years or even a lifetime. Next slide. One of the things that seems to persistently get in the way of being happy could be described as mind wandering. So I have the results here from an experiment. A couple of authors decided we're gonna buzz people on their smartphones periodically throughout the day, randomly, and ask them, what's on your mind? What are you doing? And how are you feeling? How happy are you? And they found that almost half of the time, 47 point something percent of the time, people's minds were not on the activity that they were doing. They also found that having your mind on the activity made people happier, even compared to their minds wandering to pleasant or interesting things. So if I'm doing something not so exciting, washing the dishes, if I'm focused on that, if I'm feeling the water move over my fingers, if I'm listening to the sounds around me, that tends to win out than even if I'm daydreaming about next month's vacation or tonight's delicious dinner or something like that. So I boil it down to this last phrase, it's about being present, not necessarily seeking pleasant experiences all the time. That seems to bring people happiness. Now we're gonna dive a little deep into the brain. So on the left side, you've got pictures of this default mode network. It's a fancy term for some connected brain structures in the front and the back of the brain, prefrontal cortex, uh, posterior cingulate cortex. Don't worry, no test on this tonight. Um, that seem to work together when the mind is at rest to do that mind wandering. And if you see the ABC, what is this good for? It serves autobiographical memory. We can think about what we ate for breakfast, envisioning the future, what do I wanna to do tonight? And theory of mind, thinking about other people's minds so we can build empathy, so we can build connections, all important things. If you look at the right side where I've listed, what happens if this default mode network falls into the hands of evil, meaning if it gets shifted toward unhappiness and our negative biases, then thinking about the past becomes rumination. It becomes harping on what's that regret I had? What's that mistake I made? Thinking about the future can become the what ifs, worrying, anxiety, and thinking about other people's minds can be, what are they thinking about me right now? Self-consciousness, are they judging me? 
And a lot of those can be things that we'll label as mental health symptoms, depression, anxiety. And so if you flip to the next side, slide, you can see that when they looked at the activity of this region in the brain related to happiness, they anti-correlated, meaning the more activity in this default mode network, the less happy people were in the reverse. So there's something going on in this part of the brain where our brain at rest can toggle between different modes. And if we go the way of rumination and worry and self-consciousness, that's going to be one path. And if we flip it the other way, we have opportunities for creativity, spontaneity, mindfulness being present. Next slide. So the golden question, how do we get off this hedonic treadmill? Can we do something to change our happiness? That would be the end of the presentation if the answer were no, but there are actually lots of things we can do. So let's flip to the next one. Going back to sort of defining our terms, if we're gonna try and change our happiness, we have to know where we stand. So I won't ask you all to, to put in your scores here, but you can look at the items. There's, it's this uh, validated scale called the flourishing scale to rate one to seven. And think about how this lands in your life. I lead a purposeful and meaningful life. My social relationships are supportive and rewarding. I'm engaged in my daily activities. I actively contribute to the well-being of others. I feel competent and capable in activities that are important to me. I'm a good person, live a good life. I'm optimistic about my future and people respect me. So you can imagine if you add all those together, why that might add up to a life of well-being. Flipping to the next slide, that gives you sort of a starting point if you were to use that checklist. How are we gonna move it in the direction that you wanna go? And there's no cutoff of that checklist, by the way, for happiness. It's more about using it as a measurement tool to see if we can check in later and see if our efforts are paying off. So. If you're ready, I'm going to share with you the secret sauce for sustainable happiness and flourishing. Go ahead. I think I think they're ready. It's PERMA. And now we're done. Just kidding. So PERMA is an acronym. It's um, Marty Seligman who sort of put positive psychology on the map by saying we need to really study not just mental illness and how to support ourselves and each other with that, but also how to help people flourish, whether they're dealing with mental illness or not how to help people thrive and have well-being in their lives along with mental illness or instead of mental illness, however that goes. And the science has kind of added up to this, these five letters, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment. And underlying all of those is something he calls character strengths, which are the traits that we all have, varying ones of whether it's curiosity, love, hope, kindness, gratitude, et cetera, um, and how we use them. And any character trait is not necessarily good in every situation. It's not always kind to tell the truth if uh, it may hurt somebody's feelings. So we have to balance the character strengths. But optimizing our character strengths and building on them and using them in novel ways are some of the ways that are shown to increase happiness over time sustainably. So I'm going to focus in for the last few slides and the few minutes that remaining uh, on one particular character strength, which is kindness. And this one has as much evidence as you would think kindness would have for being good for people, meaning we all kind of know this. A lot of what positive psychology and psychiatry turns up is not rocket science, it's common sense, it's ancient wisdom. But now we have the science to see exactly how do we understand and use this. So I pulled some uh, scientific studies or results related to teenagers and college students, since that's part of our audience and interest tonight starting with middle and high school students who report more self-compassion, so kindness turned toward the self, show lower amounts of stress and negative emotions and higher life satisfaction. 14 to seven year olds, self-compassion correlates negatively with depression, anxiety, meaning depression, anxiety go up, self-compassion goes down, self-compassion goes up, depression, anxiety go down, it's a negative correlation, and was associated positively with more social connectedness. College students, Self-compassion correlates with happiness, optimism, and other positive traits, and negatively correlated, again, more self-compassion, less anxiety, negative mood. And then they piled a bunch of these results together in a scientific study called a meta-analysis. They used fancy statistics to make it all be able to compare and contrast, and they found big effect sizes for the connection between self-compassion and less psychological distress, less anxiety, depression in adolescents. And we're all probably too aware that these are big challenges that we're all facing teens more than anyone else these days, and they don't seem to be going away. So we need tools to manage them 
um, and to be able to find thriving and flourishing despite the anxiety and depression. Next slide. So it's not just good for your mental health. What's good for your mind is good for your body. These are some studies of mostly adults. Um, 427 married women in this cohort followed for a long period of time, 30 years. They looked at a lot of factors that they thought might affect how long they lived. And then they found that volunteering, so kindness given toward others, that 52% of women who did not volunteer developed a major illness over this period, but only 30% 30, 30 of women who volunteered. So it seems to be protective. Another study found a 44% reduction in early death from those who volunteered a lot, which was a better size than exercising four times a week. So if you have to choose volunteering or exercise, take your pick. If you can exercise while you volunteer, that could be the best of both worlds. And then in another study, students watched a film of one of our um, sort of icons of, uh, of volunteering and kindness and compassion, Mother Teresa, and working with the poor and just observing that and having that theory of mind, thinking about what it is to uh, give and be compassionate, increased protective antibodies in the immune system. So in a time where we're still dealing with the pandemic and every new variant, and who knows what comes next, strengthening your immunity, one way you can do that is not just vaccines, but also with kindness. How do you do it? So it's pretty simple. They've done studies where performing acts of kindness doing something for somebody else, giving a compliment, holding the door, doesn't take a lot of time. If you do that for six weeks, five acts per week, people rate their happiness is improving over that time. And if you don't have six weeks, 10 days is also enough to improve life satisfaction, going up significantly. So not just a little bit, but significant differences compared to people who don't participate in acts of kindness. And going back to the brain, so this is a different view, but it's actually showing some of the same area. So here they put people in a brain scanner playing this game where they can either cooperate with each other and share the money, or they can focus on their own self-interest, kind of run away with the money, and um, they look at how the brain responds to that. So cooperating with others, this kindness, activates that default mode network. Remember, it could do future thinking. So you've got the future thinking worries, everything could be terrible pessimism, and you've got the future thinking past, path of optimism. And this kindness toward others and sharing in this game led to activate that area toward kindness and optimism. And the other piece they're showing there, so that's the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, abbreviated VMPFC. The ventral striatum is not part of the default mode network. It's part of the reward network. So here they're showing activation that kindness activated this optimism circuit and it felt rewarding. So it felt good, like eating a good meal or having a nice social connection. The reward areas were activated to motivate people to do that. Next slide. Same experiment. I just wanted to show you. This is the activity on the dark black line on top. You can see the areas kind of from zero to three. It's just moving along. And then when they find out that somebody cooperated, the dark black line goes up. So the activity in these same areas goes up high when they say, oh, this person is cooperating with me. The dash line on the bottom are the people who didn't cooperate, who they ran away with the money. And you can see the activity in that area goes down. So it's kind of an opposite. And it, it really nicely illustrates that choice. Do I want to be kind and work with others? That's going to feel good and it's going to activate these positive brain circuits. Or I can go the sort of default mode, rumination, self-consciousness, worry direction, and that's going to feel differently. Next slide. So if you want to take this home, tonight, tomorrow, whenever. There are lots of ways you can practice it. Random acts of kindness we talked about. Formal meditative way would be to practice a loving kindness meditation, sending good wishes to yourself, others, the world, even people you might not like so much. Volunteering, we talked about the direct benefits. And also you don't have to go to a place to volunteer in a program to get these benefits. Informal helping, which means helping the people who might be in the room with you, siblings, parents, caregivers, grandparents, cousins, neighbors, friends, also shows beneficial effects throughout a lifetime and an older age uh, has some of the, some higher mortality benefits in terms of how long people live than volunteering itself. So helping anyone seems to be beneficial. So I will end there and thank you for your time and attention. I don't have time to take questions, but I think the next slide may have my email address on it. So I welcome conversations or emails. Thank you very much. Maybe the next, next slide has my email.
Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenfeld, for all that really wonderful information. It's definitely great science on how to become happier in our daily lives as well when we're going through those really stressful times. My name is Jay Le Chambay, and I'm one of the senior assistant directors of admissions here at, at UVM. And I'm excited to start off this presentation to help you learn more about the admissions process, the application process, essay writing, essay writing and financial aid and scholarship information. I'll be joined by two of my colleagues at the end of my section. A couple of things that we'll be going over during my section is how to find that right fit, uh, the application platforms that you'd be utilizing to apply to college, what the entire admissions timeline looks like from beginning to end, what it means when we say the term holistic review, and I'll also be sharing some great tips for how to stay organized throughout the whole process. So when thinking of what characteristics that are important to you, you'll need to consider several factors. It's important to think about the academic offerings at an institution. You know, what majors do they have, honors programs, faculty, academic opportunities. It's also important to consider the other aspects that make up a college campus and community like the profile of college. When I say that, I mean location, size, and demographics. If specific learning opportunities are important to you, it might be helpful to search based on study abroad options, research, or inter internship offerings. Additionally, consider what you'd be doing outside the classroom, and how you get involved. Extracurricular activities might be a priority for you. Now, none of these are more important than the others, and the answers are likely to be different for you than they are for your peers or your parents or your siblings. This is why you need to think about these questions seriously and from your own perspective, because it's all about what your priority is. This will help to ensure that you find a school where you can truly thrive. The college admissions process uh, comes into full swing in the final bit of your junior year of high school into the summer before your senior year. This is when you be can begin attending college fairs in person or virtually to hear from admissions representatives about their schools and creating that list of potential colleges of interest and planning some college visits both virtually and in person. You can also begin to draft an essay in order to get feedback from your high school English teachers, your counselors, your peers, or other mentors over the summer. I would encourage you to create a list of activities and involvements from the past few years. Any organized club or organization, participation in workshops or conferences, jobs or volunteer work that has kept you busier are all things that colleges want to know about. Now, lastly, you want to make sure that you're thinking about registering for the SAT or the ACT so that you'll be prepared with test scores in case any of the schools of interest do require the testing. As a note, many institutions are test optional for fall of 2023 and beyond. So I encourage you to check in with the schools that you're interested in to see what their policies are. UVM is test optional through fall of 2026 and international students will continue to be test optional. The admissions timeline continues in the fall of your senior year when you can begin to fill out and submit your applications. This includes finalizing your main application essay, writing any supplemental essays at colleges that you're applying to or looking for, requesting letters of recommendation from your teachers, counselors, or coaches, and informing your school counselors of the schools that you're applying to. They'll then be able to submit your school profile and transcript to each institution. The fall is also when the FAFSA will become available for students applying for the following semester. You'll learn more about the FAFSA in our next segment, but this is an important step if you'd like to be considered for federal financial aid at the schools to which you're applying. Lastly, in the fall, you can continue to visit colleges and connect with admissions representatives to ask questions about their institutions. Consider asking about special visit options like in virtual programming, such as attending a class or meeting with a current student. There are two widely used application platforms that many institutions across the country utilize. The Common Application with about 900 institutions and the Coalition Application with about 135 institutions. Students can make accounts with these platforms and fill out information that can be sent to multiple institutions at once. Some schools do offer their own application as an alternative as well. Now, in regards to the types of admission, there are four really major categories you have to keep in mind. Early decision is a binding contract. Students are only permitted to apply to one institution ED, and if they get in, they're required to attend that institution. The deadline for ED1 is often in November. Some institutions also offer this binding option in January, which is known as ED2. 
Early action, on the other hand, has a fall deadline as well. Often it's November 1st, but there are no requirements that a student has to attend that institution if they're admitted. They simply hear a decision earlier and have more time to weigh their options throughout the process. For ED and EA applications, decisions are often released before the new year. Regular decision is the next option, which has a deadline often in, in January, and students will typically hear the decision between late February through early April, depending on which school they apply to. Some institutions also offer a rolling admissions process in which students can apply throughout the year, and they'll hear a decision within a few weeks after their application becomes complete, rather than waiting for one specific, specific decision release deadline. Some schools have specific requirements for admissions, such as a GPA minimum or a testing minimum. However, it's becoming very common for schools to use a holistic approach to reviewing application. This means that we look at more than just a GPA or test score to make a decision, but we look at all of the components of your application to determine if you'll be a good fit for our institutions. Components used in the holistic review are listed here on the left-hand side of the screen. All of these pieces are used to gain a more comprehensive understanding of who you are beyond just your academic qualifications. At the end of the day, schools are looking to build a class and all of these items can help them shape the full picture of who you are as a student and as a person. So to go back to our admissions timeline, the, the winter is when students can expect to receive admissions decisions depending on which type of admission you applied under, EEA, ED versus RD. You also wanna be in touch with the financial aid office to ensure that all of your required documentation is on file and that there are no missing supplementary documents. Now is also a really good time to look for additional sources of funding, which we'll talk a little bit later on uh, in the financial aid portion of the program. As your senior year spring arrives, you, you'll have heard from your admissions decision from all your schools that you applied to. This is a good time to revisit them and connect with admissions representatives or current students to ask any remaining questions that you may have. Make a list of pros and cons or chart to, to keep all these details organized for your choices. Be sure to look closely at all the billable costs, uh, as well as expected additional costs, such as travel to campus, books, entertainment. Then take a look at your full financial aid package to understand what you'll be responsible for paying. May 1st is the deadline, uh, the decision de deadline. Uh, that is a day by when you will make your decision of which school that you wanted to attend. Then it's time to celebrate with the loved ones for all the hard work that you've put in and all that you've achieved throughout this whole cycle. So before I wrap up, I want to leave you with a few helpful tips to help you stay organized throughout this whole process. Schools will be communicating with you. I'm going to rephrase that. Schools will be communicating with you a lot. Make a professional email account and uh, make sure that you have all these communications filed in one space. Keep yourself organi organized by making folders within your email and physical folders at home for each school you're considering. Make one college calendar where you can keep track of all important dates such as application deadlines, decision release dates, special events, financial aid deadlines, etc. Plan your visits to colleges. Register for any supplemental virtual programming you're interested in. Keep a list of questions you have or people or departments that you want to meet and reach out in advance to try to set up those meetings. Lastly, be sure to keep documentation handy or know where to find it if they're needed or to be submitted officially, like testing or, or transcripts. I want to thank you for your attention and I, I hope this has been helpful to set the stage. My colleague Carrie Pratt will now, now take you through the essay writing process. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Carrie Pratt. I'm a Senior Assistant Director of Admission here at the University of Vermont, and I'm going to be speaking to you tonight, tonight about writing the admission essay, some tips and some thoughts on what might help you as you start to make that decision about what you're going to write about and how you're going to write it. So tonight I'm going to be speaking specifically about the common application essay, but you can rest assured that no matter what application you choose to fill out, there will be sort of a main essay as a part of it, and these tips will still guide you even if you're not choosing the common application. But the Common App is a mandatory piece of the application. It has a 650 word maximum, and there are a lot of different topics you can choose from, including a topic of your choice. So you really have a lot of freedom in what it is that you choose to do and what you choose to write about. One thing that's important for you to note on this particular slide is that this essay goes to all of the colleges that you're applying to. So this is not the place to speak about why you'd like to go to a particular institution as all of the schools you're applying to will see this. And you wanna make sure that it's broad enough that it will help them in their decision-making process and not inadvertently name a different school that you're choosing to apply to. 
So we'll talk for a little bit about what the essay is and what the essay is not. The essay really doesn't have to be a specific thing. It's, if it's authentic to you and it's well written, it can really be about just about anything. So you can see here some thoughts about what an essay could be. It could be for showing your writing skills, giving a sense of your personality, for telling your story. I want you to consider the idea of what would your application be incomplete without? And that's a really nice option of something you might want to write your essay about. There's also a lot of things that the essay is not. You have to consider all of the information that Jay just spoke about in his presentation that your admissions counselor will have. They will have your transcripts, they may have test scores, they may have words from teachers or guidance counselors about what you are, have been up to in high school. Those sort of things are not where you wanna be focusing your attention in your college application essay. For example, if you just restate your resume, I've already seen that and it's not something that you need to spend your time doing in your main college application essay. So what else can you tell your reader? What makes you, you? And also take the pressure off of yourself. It doesn't have to be your entire life story. It, it cannot be your entire life story. So think of a sliver, a piece, something that your application would be incomplete if you didn't address, and that might be a great place to spend time for your essay. So it's always good to listen to more than one source. So I've got some friends here who've spoken about what the essay is. The National Association of College Admission Counseling says, ask your friends what they are writing and then don't write about that. And then Princeton Review says, the best way to tell your story is to write a personal, thoughtful essay about something that has meaning for you. Be, on be honest and genuine and your unique qualities will show through. One of the most common questions that I get asked when I'm speaking about essays is what does an admissions counselor want to read? What is going to be sort of that key to the admission counselor's part? And there really is no such thing. The admission counselor wants to read something that you have spent time writing and that you have enjoyed and really put yourself into. You just have to be you. The most successful essays are really written without the attempt to be something that you're not. This is a main theme that I want you to think about throughout my presentation and the evening. Colleges are looking for students who will be a great fit at their school. So bringing your authentic self is going to only help you in the long run. And that's true for the essay, definitely. So that being said, while there's no particular secret thing that you need to do in order to write a strong essay, there are still some insights that can help you understand how an admissions counselor does review an essay. So when I'm reviewing an essay, I'm often wondering or thinking to myself, what else can I learn here? What gaps can I fill in? And then also, what does the student want me to know about them? It's a really great window into you and what you're thinking about at this time, what's important to you, so that you can uh, kind of sh put your best foot forward. That's a really important piece for me. And then I'm also looking for your writing skills. And then of course that you've put evidence it, uh, sorry, evidence that you've put time into your essay. It really says a lot that you've put energy and time into your essay, and that's something that is really valuable. When you think about um, application readers reading hundreds, maybe thousands of essays, you want to show that you've put time and energy into your essay because they're putting time and energy into reading it and considering your application. All of that being said, I want the biggest takeaway for you here to be is that it is less important what you write about and it is more important how you write it. So how do you write it, right? That's your question. I think if you focus on the next slide, gives you the four things or four ideas that you may focus on one or maybe more than one. So if you're taking a topic, let's say an international trip that you went on, recounting the international trip from beginning to end is probably not gonna be a great essay for a variety of reasons. Number one, other people on your trip might write the same one. And number two, it's just not super in, you know, in, in uh, align with what it is that is so important to you about the trip. But if you focus on reflection, analysis, outcomes, learning, those are things where you can take that essay to the next level. So if you reflect on your experience in the trip and how you have taken that reflection forward, that could potentially be a really great essay topic. So focusing on one or more of these four things is really gonna help you no matter what your topic is. So of course, we wanna make our English teacher proud. We want to make sure that our essay is a good representation of who we are and that we put care into it. So you're taking those lessons that you've been learning since elementary school and putting them into practice. I wanna make sure you know that I wouldn't have put it on this slide if I hadn't seen it in an essay before. So make sure that you're using paragraph breaks and that you're really focusing on having 
proper writing skills in this fairly important piece of writing that you're going to be submitting. You also want to make sure that you're not using a lot of dialogue and you're also not using a thesaurus just to sound sort of lofty or smart. You want to be authentic. A thesaurus is not authentic. Having someone else write your essay for you, not authentic. As I said previously, you know that the admission counselor is looking for people who are going to be a good fit at their school. So don't allow anyone to pressure you into changing your essay into something that you don't want it to be. Schools are looking for you, not your parent or your English teacher or your counselor or whoever else might be pressuring you to write a particular thing. This one's pretty easy. Don't plagiarize. It's simple and I am very happy that you all have agreed that you will not be plagiarizing. So that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful thing. So for my final thoughts here about the college admission essay, I want you to really focus on being yourself and showcasing your writing skills. If you do both of those things while also focusing on growth, learning, outcomes, and or analysis, you have really great um, setup for an excellent essay. And if all of your friends could write the same essay, consider writing about something else. I'm going to be happy to take questions in the chat as we go throughout the evening, but I'm going to queue up my colleague Bridget to share some more information with you. Thank you, Carrie, for those great pieces of information on writing an excellent essay. My name is Bridget Baldwin. I'm one of the senior assistant directors here at the University of Vermont. And though my role is in admissions, I like to share some basics about financial aid and funding your education. I spent some time in higher education working in the financial aid sphere, and I hope that we can have some fun today while providing you a foundational understanding of the best practices in building your college financial aid package. In higher education, we use a lot of acronyms. Here are some that you should know when discussing financial aid. The first is FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's the free option to apply for need-based aid and is used by nearly all colleges and universities. You may hear these terms while you're completing your FAFSA. The first one is DRT, or Data Retrieval Tool. This, use, this tool is used to pull your family's IRS tax information into the FAFSA instead of having to enter it all. I have to tell you, this is the best tool on the FAFSA. It will save you a lot of time and frustration if you're able to use the data retrieval tool. The school code. School codes are used to indicate the schools you'd like the FAFSA information shared with. So you wanna make sure you're listing the school codes for the schools that you're most interested in. Do you know that only 10 school codes can be used on the FAFSA? As you decide that you may not be interested in a school anymore and a school moves up your list, you can add that school code to the FAFSA at a later date. CSS Profile, College Scholarship Service Profile. This form requires additional family financial information to package your aid. The form is not required by all schools. For example, UVM does not require this form. EFC is the next one, and one that you've probably already heard, Expected Family Contribution but it's changed to SAI or Student Aid Index. The Student Aid Index is a measurement used to determine eligibility for need-based aid in the financial aid process. It does not indicate what you will pay for your education. So I always like to have a little fun and think about aid as buckets. So the first bucket that you have is your merit-based aid or your scholarships. And we'll talk more about those. Those are based on your academic quality. And then there's the other bucket, the need-based aid bucket. This is determined by the information that you provide on your FAFSA or CSS profile. We'll break those down over the next few slides. So let's start with scholarships, free money. This means that this is a gift to you and you don't need to pay it back. There are two types, um, and we'll look at 
for this category. Internal given by the institutions you're applying to and external scholarships awarded by all types of local and national organizations. So let's chat a little bit about the internal or merit-based scholarships first. As it says, it's based off your academic merit and awarded by the institutions that you're applying to. External scholarships are offered through a number of organizations. Really start to think about what organizations do you know about? Local organizations like Knights of Columbus or Elks Clubs, along with your parents' employers, maybe your employer, and other community organizations. These are based off of filling out applications and based off awarding, based on your involvement, community service, as well as your academics as you provide on each of your applications. The next free money is grants. Now grants do fall under need-based aid and it's tied to the family and the student's income. Grants can be given by the federal government. Some are provided from your state and it also can be pro provided as part of the institution's need-based aid package. Understand it doesn't take, it does take a little bit of work to mine and to investigate all of these free money options, but it really can be worth it in the end if you take the time, fill out the applications to bridge that gap in your tuition bill. The last part of the bucket I wanna discuss is loans or borrowed money. Based off the news, borrowing student loans and having debt can seem really, really scary. Here are some thoughts on loans. Loans can help make college affordable as it is an investment in your future. However, sometimes it's necessary to be realistic about the amount of loans needed and whether the school is financially feasible for you and your family. When deciding on loans, consult with the college financial aid offices and your local resources. Do you understand that if you do wanna qualify for any federal loans, you do need to submit the FAFSA. So even if you feel you may not be eligible for need-based aid, to be eligible to receive federal loans, you will need to submit your FAFSA. Now, as Jay discussed, the timeline for all of this is really important to make sure that you have research that is done and that you're starting everything early this can lessen the stress of the process for you and your family. First date to remember is that you can begin to complete the FAFSA in October of your senior year. Make sure that during this time, you're researching deadlines for local scholarships and that you and your family are using your list of colleges to take a spin at each of their net price calculators. You can find these net price calculators on each of the college's websites for financial aid. So again, file the FAFSA in October. That's for domestic students only. In the senior year, winter, once you've almost got those applications ready to go, finalize your scholarship applications also. And then always make sure that federal financial aid paperwork is submitted and if you've been called for verification or need any extra requested items that you've submitted that. Review and compare financial aid awards. I highly recommend a tool as easy as a spreadsheet. Write all of your colleges in and put those buckets on there. So your free aid or your merit scholarships and that need-based aid bucket so that you are comparing those colleges equally for each of those areas. In the process, remember, there's always resources to assist you in navigating. So reach out to the experts, they're really here to help. We've touched only the tip of the iceberg for financial aid tonight. So attend any local financial aid nights and speak with your school counseling staff about scholarship opportunities and make sure they understand the timelines that you're working under. And then 
Always know that the student financial aid offices at each of the schools are there to provide you guidance. Good luck in your search, and I'm going to turn it over to Moses, who's going to take us to the next portion of our program this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bridget, Carrie, Jay, and Dr. Rosenfeld. You know, the information you provided this evening, no doubt, has been wonderfully beneficial to our audience members. And now it's time for our panel. As I mentioned earlier, our experts have a, a lot of, of insight for you and they're ready to share. This is your opportunity to use that Q&A feature that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we'll have our panelists give a short introduction uh, and then we're going to dive right into some questions. I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've compiled some of the most often asked questions that we get uh, kind of to get us started here as you're thinking about the questions that you know you're going to ask uh, in the Q&A uh, feature. Um, again, I very much encourage you to take advantage of that feature. Uh, certainly now is the time. That's why you're here and that's why uh, we're here to be a, a resource for you. As a reminder, of course, our admission staff will be answering some of those sort of one-off questions privately and directly, but as questions uh, come up that seem to be frequently asked amongst the audience, uh, we'll be sure to publish those so uh, our panelists can weigh in. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist to begin uh, introductions. Nicole, why don't you take it away? Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, really excited to hopefully provide some advice along the way. I'm Nicole Curvin. I'm Dean of Admissions at Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont. I use she, her pronouns, and I've worked in college admissions and higher education for more than 25 years. Uh, first position uh, in higher ed was actually at the University of Vermont, but I've also worked at other institutions, including New York University and Cornell and Marlboro College. So excited to be with you, and hopefully we can share some good insights uh, as we move along in the program. I'm going to pass it over to Chris. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. And hi, everyone. My name is Chris Berlongo, Associate Director of Admissions at the University of Vermont. I use he, him pronouns and I'm a proud first generation of college student originally from New York City. Uh, this fall, I'll be starting my 21st year in higher education, serving in various roles as an admissions officer, athletics coach, residence life director, and first year course instructor. I've been fortunate enough in my career to serve at some incredible institutions, also at New York University, Fordham University, American University, Wagner College, Champlain College, and the last three years at UVM. So thank you for making the space to be here tonight. We hope you're finding the program both enjoyable and informative. And with that, I'll turn over to my colleague from Boston University, Duffy. Hi there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Duffy Moran. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm a senior associate director of admissions at Boston University, where I've worked for just over 17 years. I actually started my 18th year yesterday. Uh, prior to working at BU, I came to love and appreciate admissions work as a tour guide in the Advocat program uh, during my undergraduate years at the University of Vermont. So I'm a proud Catamount alum. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Melanie, from here. Thank you. A uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Melanie Element and I use the pronouns she, her. I'm joining you from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. So bringing an international uh, school and perspective to the mix. I've been at McGill and active within the admissions and recruitment office for over 10 years. They've also attended two other Canadian universities as part of my formative years. So uh, hopefully bringing some Canadiana uh, your way through this conversation this evening and I'll toss it back over to Moses. Well again thank you all for being here and being willing to share your expertise. You know Nicole this first question is for you uh, you know working at a, a highly selective institution I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know what is the most important criteria when reviewing a, a student's application and, and you know how can students help their application stand out? Thanks for that question. 
Um, I want to start with uh, just giving a, a quick overview of the ways in which institutions approach um, reviewing applications and giving consideration to applicants. And it's important to remember that institutions are building communities. And so when we're looking to evaluate applications, and uh, it was wonderful to hear all of the helpful tips um, earlier in the program about the application and staying organized. Um, I think the things that we're looking for, particularly in institutions where um, we know that we are going to have a really difficult uh, time evaluating applications is in addition to the straightforward components of the application, including the application, the academic profile of a student, the ways in which you've performed in classes, the ways in which you've challenged yourself um, in your academic subjects, uh, the, who you show up as in your campus or college or school community, um, all of those things are add on to the idea that you should understand the institutions that you're applying to. And so the other factor that we're reviewing and considering as we're thinking about whether a student can be successful at Middlebury is um, it has the student sort of given some thought to the type of institutions that they're applying to and the ways in which they demonstrate that in their application through extracurricular involvements, the ways they talk about the things that they're interested in currently, with it, the ways they talk about their future. Those are the pieces and elements that are important um, and help students stand out in the process as they're looking at lots of different types of institutions. So I, I would say building community is a, a first and foremost important part of what an admissions office is looking to do as they're reviewing applications going forward. Back to you, Moses. Thank you, Nicole. Chris, uh, you're up next. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how applicants can, can best demonstrate their in interest in a particular institution, especially now that schools are providing both in-person and, and virtual visit options. Sure thing, and thank you, Moses. And thanks for that question. And first, let's establish that during the last two years, just like you couldn't visit our campuses, we couldn't visit you either. So don't feel like you're behind. Just by being here tonight, you're not only showing your preparedness, but you're also demonstrating your interest in this process. So be confident in that. Know that we too are excited to get back to engaging with students in numerous ways, on campus, at your high schools, at college fairs, and yet still virtually. At UVM, we've been hosting events on campus and traveling to high schools to meet students where they are, but there is still a place for virtual as it provides a level of access to an institution that saves both travel time and cost. So while virtual shouldn't be your only point of contact if you can avoid it, it's a great place to start. But as Moses mentioned, now that visit restrictions have mostly been lifted, and hopefully they stay that way, there are many ways to both visit virtually and in person. First, let's talk about how each school is gonna have their own considerations in this process, and they likely will vary. So while the information you hear tonight is a great foundation, you should check in with each school you are interested in just to see what their own specific process requires. Demonstrated interest is a great example of this. Some schools will heavily favor it, some schools won't consider it at all, and some will do so to varying degrees. So keep in mind that it's only one part of a comprehensive holistic application review process that you heard about earlier from my colleague Jay. Holistic means essentially that we are accounting for all parts of your application. Grades, testing, if applicable, many schools are test optional now, recommendation letters, essay, and any other element that that school lists as a requirement. And again, these are gonna vary, so check your, uh, check your schools. So how to demonstrate your interest? The traditional routes include a campus visit, and make sure you register for that visit when you do decide to come see that school, connecting with your colleges at a high school or college fair, or scheduling an interview if that school offers it. Again, each school is gonna be a little bit different, so check on this. And while those in-person avenues are mostly back this year, the virtual space has taught us there are many other ways. Registering for an online event, contacting your admissions counselor, or even engaging with our emails and virtual outreach are all ways of demonstrating your interest in the institution. And I'm gonna own this. As I'm sure you've seen already, you're gonna get emails from your schools. A lot of emails. So expect outreach from every college you engage with during the course of this process. And I advise students to set up a college-specific email address just to help you manage the volume you're gonna see all in one place. So ultimately, whether or not the school does or does not consider demonstrated interest, it can't hurt. 
just as long as you don't overdo it. A well-timed email after a visit, after you submit your application, with any questions during your search, it's all fair game. We'd love to hear from you, just not every day. And no, that's not a made up example, but that's a story for another day. Moses, back to you. Thank you, Chris. So Duffy, uh, COVID-19, uh, it's canceled so many things uh, in this world, uh, but included in that are opportunities for prospective students, whether they be extracurricular activities, jobs, clubs, organizations that they can take part in. So I imagine, at least if it were me, there's probably applicants out there worried about not having as many activities listed on their applications that they would have otherwise if they weren't otherwise impacted by COVID-19. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how this change might affect a student's admissibility to your institution and also, you know, how students should share any impacts that the pandemic might have created for them in the application process. Great, thank you, Moses. So um, I think it's really important to really look at the role of extracurricular activities and, and the role they play when thinking about this question. Um, it's a question I get a lot of, and it's a question I've heard from many students, um, just because we know how disruptive COVID has been for so many students over the last few years and so many people. Um, we've all had different disruptions we faced. Uh, but for high school students, it's meant a lot of canceled events, canceled activities, uh, things that were really important to them and things that they were excited to showcase in their college applications. Um, luckily, one of the first pieces of advice when I, I think about extracurricular activities and that I try to pass along to students taking part in this process is avoid doing things with the sole goal of having it look good on college applications. Um, as you're thinking about the admissions process, uh, try not to let it steer your high school experience. The whole point of this process is really finding a fit between students and the schools they're interested in by sharing who they are, what inspires them, what motivates them, and as an institution, we want to see what students like to do when they're not in the classroom. Um, outside of a small cohort, some of the most impressive things I've seen when reviewing an application have often fallen outside of many of these things that are canceled, outside of those traditional buckets of sports, the arts, and service. It's often the quirky, the interesting, the unique things students find themselves doing that are most likely to stand out when we review an application. And that's not to say those bigger traditional group activities aren't important and aren't a big part of your life as a high school student. Um, you're hearing from a person who wrote a college essay about high school hockey uh, in the great state of Vermont. Um, so I, I definitely am well aware of that and, and thoughtful of that whenever I review an essay, but rather it's to explain what's most important to us as we're trying to review your application, which is that we're trying to get an understanding of who you are um, based on what you do with your time outside the classroom. So we understand that many of you had significant disruptions um, to those things that you really love to do. And we're really just looking to understand a bit more about what you were doing with your time. Um, and we understand it's probably not going to fall into the traditional extracurricular activities that we've seen over the years for most students. So while you've lost some of those traditional activities, I think it's really important to think back on how you spent that time um, and think about what you were doing when you weren't in school. Were you helping a family member and helping your family navigate that challenging time that we've been in? Um, were you keeping clubs and organizations going on Zoom or trying to get different activities off the ground, um, creating Zoom events, creating different ways to, to interact while still having social distancing? Were you reading, baking, uh, taking part in game nights with family, um, perhaps more realistically binge watching and becoming obsessed with a new show, um, helping a younger sibling with virtual learning, dropping food off, um, making time to check in with elderly family, playing an instrument um, on your own. How did you spend that time? What were you doing? And um, as was described at, at various points, how did that affect your authentic experience and yourself? Um, and that's what colleges and universities are looking to see. So. When we look at activities, it's not really the sheer volume of accomplishments or activities presented. Um, often it's not even necessarily the activity itself that's of primary concern. We're really interested in the experience you've had by participating in the activity, um, the education that's been imparted to you, the growth you've experienced, the passion, joy, happiness, fulfillment um, that's been provided by it. If you can let us know what your life looked like, what you were able to accomplish, how you navigated a challenging time, um, I think you'll be on the right track for the admissions process. And remember, we are people who are reviewing your application. Uh, we've been going through many of the same issues in our own ways. Um, everyone has had experienced COVID slightly differently. Everyone has seen different things, experienced different things within their families, um, experienced different amounts of loss, um, whether that's activities, whether it's 
um, people, whether it's uh, it's so many things around us. Um, and so as we review an application, we definitely are going to be understanding of what that time may have looked like for you. Um, there are additional prompts um, in your, your college application. You can always use additional space to communicate um, anything that was particularly meaningful during that time or had a particularly profound um, impact on you during that time. We want to know. Um, we want to understand. So much of what we do is about context and understanding the context that a student is providing along with their activities, along with their essays, along with all the different parts that are coming to us in the college application. And so if you can provide context on what that time looked like, what you're able to do with that time, um, and how you're able to engage your mind, engage socially, engage in the communities around you, um, you'll have uh, met, met your goals um, in this college application process, and you'll have communicated to us who you are what you've experienced and what you're looking for within that fit at a college or university. I'll turn it back over to Moses from here. Thanks. Melanie, my friend north of the border, I wonder uh, what advice would you give to students who are starting the search process and more specifically, what advice you would give to sort of stay organized? Well, you know, uh, Moses, I was listening in to Jay when he was uh, chatting about being organized and a lot of those things really resonated with me. Um, you know, making those calendars for all of your schools, being aware of deadlines and upcoming events, um, things never being too early to start in the process and gathering information. Um, also taking the time to schedule the types of interactions um, that you're interested in, whether that would be going on campus for a visit, making time for a virtual visit, attending um, a webinar, connecting in various ways. Um, but another piece of advice to that organization is giving that same amount of time, not only to your first choice school, but all the schools that you are applying to so that you are finding that you are on top of things for each application um, that you are going to be submitting um, and you're giving that same respect and time to the process. Um, and you'll see that, you know, even as early as your junior year, the courses that you're selecting are going to have an impact uh, when it comes to schools that you're applying to. So giving yourself that space and time to be organized for each um, school that you are considering on top of all the tools that Jay mentioned earlier uh, would be my piece of advice. And I know there are a lot of audience questions, so I'm going to throw back uh, to Moses um, so that we can cover more of uh, the questions that are popping up. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so, Nicole, you know, so many schools um, whether before the pandemic or as a result of the pandemic have turned to test optional uh, policies and I'm often asked you know what does test optional really mean so while SAT ACTs aren't necessarily mandatory is a student's application looked at or evaluated differently if they don't submit standardized test scores Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I want to start first with saying um, it's really important to ask the question of the institutions that you're applying to and the institutions that you're visiting. Um, test optional uh, means um, slightly different things, I would say, as, as schools are evaluating applications um, in terms of what Middlebury thinks about um, as we're reviewing applications is um, making sure that we're not disadvantaging students um, when that information is not in front of us. Um, and so we spent a fair amount of time doing uh, practice and having conversations about the ways in which we're evaluating applications with testing and without testing. Um, about half of our pool submitted and half of our pool uh, opted not to, um, and the same held true for our admit class. Um, as well. So um, when we're looking at applications that have testing, um, we're looking at all of those components that we've already talked about. We're looking at the um, information about an academic transcript, the ways students have performed in classes, um, the things that they talk about in terms of outside of the classroom experiences and opportunities, um, what their voice is in their essay and letters of support as well. Um, and, you know, I think when we are 
um, evaluating with and without testing. Um, obviously, at the core of the application process is really um, the academic experience that a student has had and the ways in which they've approached their academics and pushed themselves um, moving beyond that. Um, and and for Middlebury, we, we truly mean we are test optional. And so there isn't a wink around whether or not a student should really be submitting that information to us. Um, we believe strongly that we can evaluate applications um, in with and without that information. And for the last couple of years, many, many institutions have been able to admit students and evaluate applications without testing. In fact, many institutions have been test optional for a very long period of time. And so it, it is one of those areas as you're doing your college search, um, when you're talking to admissions officers and you're talking to your school counselor, that you also want to think about asking that question and what it means for the institution that you're looking at. Um, in some places, um, testing may be required for things like merit scholarships. Um, and so that's what I mean about the distinction of institutions and the ways in which schools are applying that policy going forward. Um, I would say trust us and know that institutions um, are thinking about that policy and moving forward with that policy for the next several years. And again, want to reiterate that students are being admitted without testing. Um, so keep that in mind. I know there's a high level of anxiety about whether we really mean what we're saying um, in this process. Um, so turn it back to you. Thank you, Nicole. Great advice, and I think all of my colleagues would agree. Uh, when we say test optional, we, we do mean, in fact, test optional. So Chris, uh, another question from the audience, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, what is your advice for someone who's seeking to graduate a year early? Is that something that would hurt their application? Do you have any advice you can provide? Sure thing. Thanks, Moses, and thank you for the question. Um, you know, the cardinal rule you've heard about tonight, the familiar refrain has been, it depends on the institution. So talk to your school or college. That part is critical and see what your admissions officer or counselor would advise for that school. In general, it's all about context. What have you done in the three or so years you've been at that institution, speaking for US-based schools? Have you taken full advantage of the curriculum, the activities, the clubs, the organizations, the strength of curriculum that's out there? And in particular, any courses that are required for the major you're applying to at that individual school or college. You want to be considerate of what you're looking at. So again, it's going to take some consultation with that admissions office of your particular school to ensure that you're setting yourself up for your best application candidacy as possible. Because to be totally transparent, schools are getting more competitive. Applications are being more submitted are being submitted in greater numbers. You're going to be competing against students who have filled all four years of college in most cases. So you need to understand that you are going against that context and with that mindset that while it necessarily hurt your application, you want to ensure that you're making your candidacy as robust as possible before going forth with that plan to graduate early. Of course, another caveat to this will be what you're doing with that extra year. Are you going straight to college? Are you doing some type of study abroad or gap year experience? So again, there are some variables that definitely worth reaching out to a counselor for. But it's going to take some conversation with that. And again, depending on the context of what you plan on doing in those three years. Moses? So, Duffy, this next question is for you. In, in our years uh, collectively uh, in this line of work, we've seen students do all sorts of, of different things. But I, I wonder, related to this question, I, I wonder if you could talk about you know, how many schools you would recommend that a student put on their list and apply to during this application process. Great, thanks Moses. And uh, similar to what Chris was just saying, how so many policies vary by institution, um, I think my answer to this question often obviously would vary depending on the student, what that student's looking for and uh, what that student's looking for from the application process, what types of schools that student's looking at and how they are approaching their application process. Often you'll hear eight to 10 as a good number, um, but again, it really is a personalized process depending on where a student's looking, how they're evaluating the schools that they're interested in. If a student's applying to a large number of highly selective institutions, institutions where maybe 15, 20% of the students applying are admitted, um, they may want to make sure that they have a number of schools that they also have a strong options behind that. Um, so if in general there's 
three or four schools that might be reach schools that a student's applying to, a few schools that seem right down the line and schools that, that are a good fit um, academically and financially, and a couple schools where students know they have a strong opportunity to be admitted um, and a strong opportunity to find that fit again. Um, it's making sure that you have options available, options in terms of places that you're going to be happy academically, happy socially, um, that you're going to find the fit you're looking for, and options where you also know that you'll be financially happy, that your family will be able to make that commitment and that you'll be in a place where it will be putting you in a good position at the end of four years to graduate um, and and move on without necessarily having to be um, having too high of an amount of debt or things like that. So um, for every student, it's going to vary a little bit. I think having those factors into consideration, what types of schools are you looking at? What are you looking for from those schools? And um, how are you building your list? is going to be the most important part of that process. Um, if you're applying to a bunch of conservatory schools for the fine arts, it's going to look a lot different than a student who might be looking at business programs and a specific geographic area. So be thoughtful of the admission statistics um, and where you might fall within the pool. Uh, be thoughtful of financial aid and how those come together. And be thoughtful of making sure that you're going to have options when this process ends. And I think that's the best way you're going to find that number that's right for each student and use whatever resources you have available. Um, often these are great conversations to be having with college counselors, high school counselors, whoever it is that you have there because they have experience. They have um, uh, they have years and years of, of experience of records often um, where they can talk to you a little bit about how a student with your profile might line up at different institutions and help you to build that fit. So whichever resources you have available, whichever resources are there for you, um, definitely think about making sure you're, you're using those as you build out that list. Moses, I'll turn it back to you. So, Melanie, as I'm sure our audience members are well aware, and as I, I mentioned earlier, you, you work at a, a wonderful institution uh, in Canada. And I wonder if you could share any advice for students who are in the audience that might be applying to a, a Canadian institution. And talk a little bit about how the, the application process, perhaps the scholarship process might differ between the U.S. system and the Canadian system. Absolutely. So for those of you who may be considering um, a Canadian university education, you're certainly going to encounter maybe some differences in the lingo. First, in Canada, it's always your university search versus college search. Um, and you will find that while we do have commonalities across the country being four-year university uh, degrees that are offered, um, that most of our institutions are publicly funded uh, institutions, um, and a number of them quite reputable, um, and having some consistency in the pricing and degrees that are offered. When it comes to the application, there is going to be a bit of a difference, not only from the U.S. system, but between universities in Canada. So it's always really important to take a look at each school that you're considering, um, to look at the deadlines, the requirements um, that you might be encountering. For instance, you're not going to see a centralized system for all Canadian schools. Some provinces, such as Ontario, will have a central application that you can use to apply to their universities. But for the most part across Canada, you are applying to each individual institution um, and you're not going to be using the common app like you use for U.S. schools. Um, you will find that requirements can differ, but for the most part, um, it is going to be a grades based process, um, which is quite different um, from what you're encountering with U.S. schools where supplements and reference letters are driving forces um, within the admissions review. When you're applying to Canadian schools, we are predominantly looking at grades. Um, when testing is available, we do look at test scores, but just like in the U.S., um, most of our institutions have gone test optional as well. Um, so always important to check out the requirements for uh, each school that you might be considering in Canada. Um, and then just adding to that when it comes to scholarships, 
and um, aid funding that you might uh, be seeking. Um, each institution, again, uh, will have different policies when it comes to scholarships and financial aid at McGill. Um, our financial aid, as well as our scholarships, are open both to our domestic Canadian students as well as international students, but that might not be the case at every Canadian school. So that's a little bit of the Canadian admissions process in a nutshell. Um, one thing that you can expect that does align with the U.S. is that our regular um, admissions uh, deadline to accept your offer, we are in line with the May 1st uh, confirmation date. So I'll throw that back to Moses. All right, well, we're getting uh, somewhat close to the end of our time here, so I'd like to end with this question for each of our panelists. And Nicole, I'm going to start with you, but I'd love to hear from each of you, you know, what piece of advice would you like to share with our, our prospective students or with their, their family and, and parents, guardians, you know, regarding the college search process or the application process, what advice would you like to uh, embark upon them? I love that this conversation has come really full circle and that we started this conversation uh, together in a place of thinking about the ways in which you can maintain happiness, the ways in which you have control uh, over your happiness. And so my advice for students out there as you're embarking on this process, whatever stage you're at, is to continue to be a high school student at the same time that you're uh, considering your college choices. And so make sure that you have time to really invest in uh, the final year of your high school experience in whatever form that takes. Make sure that you continue to connect with peers and that you have opportunities um, to be a young person and to be silly and to enjoy the things that you like to do when you're not studying and you, when you're not at school. And and I think, you know, I would draw on um, the ways in which uh, Dr. Rosenfeld talked about, you know, acts of kindness, um, make this process um, important and a focus, but also make sure that you're looking around you and recognizing um, your impact on others. And so just be a high school student and remember that, that the, the college process is, is one aspect of your life at this point in time, but ultimately it's going to be about the relationships that you continue to build um, with your peers, with your teachers, with your family, and, and keep that at the center of this search. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. And yes, all great advice. And again, I hope you all learned a lot tonight. But I will emphasize the fact that this was a lot. There's a lot of information, right? You've got a lot of esteemed panelists on this um, day as up here tonight talking about a lot of good things. But don't be afraid to ask questions. I think it's really important. We're all coming from different spaces, different identities, different resources, different ways of accessing the college process, right? And I think it's really important that you're not afraid or shy or feel like you're bothering us or asking your questions about our processes because they're constantly shifting. Deadlines change, test optional, demonstrated interest. A lot of the things we talked about this evening, it's a lot of terminology and a lot of things that are happening. And even for seasoned professionals, it's, we still have to educate ourselves on a regular basis. So we don't expect you to have all the answers. And we can, we much rather have these conversations before the process, the applications roll in, all the difficult times later. Right now we have some bandwidth. So at the end of the day, whether it's yourself, parents, guardians, reach out to your resources. I think it's really important, your high school counselors as well. You have help there. And again, don't hesitate to contact your schools where you need to be. That's what we're here for. Duffy, I believe over next to you. Great, thanks, Chris. And I, I think going off that piece, um, if I were to offer advice, it, it would be just on that idea that there is so much information. There's so much information presented tonight, and this is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the college search process. So um, there is a lot to sort through. There's a lot of information to sort through. There's a lot of different pieces to be looked at. And I think it be, can be really confusing and complicating, uh, complicated to families and students as you're trying to sort out um, what the most important pieces are for you. Um, we've talked a lot about what many of those important pieces are for us as, as colleges and universities um, as a review application, but really being thoughtful about what's the most important piece for you as you approach this college search process, what's going to deem the best fit. And um, a big part of that is 
making sure that you're being considerate of the whole range, the thousands of colleges and universities that are out there. Um, and as part of that, being careful about letting characteristics like rankings and admissions selectivity data take away from what you're really trying to do and what you're trying to be thoughtful about. Um, there is there are so many great schools out there and whatever criteria is being used to drive any ranking that exists is likely very different from those things that you're specifically looking for in a college. Even if there's some overlap, it's certainly not going to be one to one. So um, fit's going to be found by looking at the programs offered, looking at the community on the campus, looking at how well a place aligns with who you are, what your values are, where you'll be happy and successful for four years. Um, similarly, looking at a lot of admission statistics can give you a good idea of likelihood of admission. Um, I think it can it can help as you navigate that piece of the puzzle, which is a big piece. Um, but also understand that it's not going to tell you all that much about the quality of the institution inherently just in the numbers of the students who are applying. Um, having a low admit rate means that an institution has a lot of students who are really interested in attending and not enough spaces for all the qualified students who may want to be there. Um, at BU, we had an admit rate of 14% last year and traditionally we fared well in the rankings. Um, I I get it in many ways. I love BU. I've worked there for over 17 years. Um, it's an amazing place to be, and I consider myself lucky to be a part of this institution. Um, that said, if a student's looking for a small rural institution, we could be the best school in the world on every single ranking and have a sub 1% admit rate if that students admitted to BU. It's probably not the best fit for them. Um, it's not going to be a place where they're probably going to be as happy. So um, understand that those numbers can be helpful if there's a place for them in the process, um, but also understand that thinking about fit really requires looking beyond the, the scope that um, is often focused on, looking beyond those schools that are um, often getting the most attention and being thoughtful about where you'll be happy. Um, as you build your list, ranking and guides can find places that meet your needs, but beyond that, really think about where you'll be successful, where you'll be happy, and where you'll thrive both inside and beyond the classroom, and know that there won't necessarily be one neat, tidy statistic or number that's going to help you find that place. It's going to be a combination of how you feel as you look at the place, how you feel as you're evaluating the institution, and what's the place that's going to be the best fit for you and where you'll be a great fit for that institution, and let that guide the search process. Um, let me turn things over to Melanie to, to finish up as we, we wrap the presentation here. Thank you. Um, so my bit of advice, I'm conscious of having both students and parents in the room, um, is one, don't be afraid for students to uh, get behind the wheel uh, and really drive this application process and college search, university search here in Canada. Um, and um, don't be afraid to ask for directions from your parents. Think about it as, you know, learning to uh, drive a car, learning to drive your bike for the first time. Um, you're going to get some guidance along the way, but at some point you're going to take control. You're going to decide um, in which direction uh, this journey is going to take you. And it's exciting um, and there might be some stop signs and detours along the way. But uh, at the end of this journey, you're going to end up at the right place where you want to be. Um, and you have a fantastic future ahead of you and it's going to take you into the next chapter of your life. So very short and sweet, um, but hopefully uh, something that you've now um, been equipped for attending this session and that uh, you're looking forward to embarking on uh, in the coming year or years ahead. Um, so uh, thanks for listening um, and I will pass this uh, back over to Moses for some last words. And you know, I think that my advice, uh, I would I would gear towards the, the parents, the guardians, the family members in the audience. You know, I think that it's important to have intentional conversations with your student ahead of time uh, about this process, about strategies to approaching this process and to agree on set times to talk with your student about this process. You know, there will no doubt be you know things as a parent or a guardian that you know you're worried about in a particular point in the process. And frankly, your student might be worried about the exact same thing at the exact same time. But I think it's important to have a conversation about, you know, when is a good time to talk about things related to the college application process and and to set boundaries so that you can sort of find a, an equilibrium and so that you can try to navigate this process together as a family, knowing that, you know, there will be there'll be times where it can be very stressful. And I think if you're intentional about having a game plan, 
about navigating it and discussing these these points of 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 stress, I think that you'll find the process to be that much uh, more easily uh, nav navigated. So uh, with that, I do want to thank our panelists for their time, their their expertise. You know, I can't just I just can't tell you how grateful I am personally that all of you would uh, be able to and willing to join us tonight. I mean, what a wealth of information from so many different perspectives. So thank you to our panelists uh, again for, for being here this evening. And folks in the audience, you know, we're at the end of our time with you. I, I hope that you've found this program helpful. Um, you know, regardless of where you go on this admissions journey, know that there, you know, there's a lot of help out there for you. Uh, you know, we hope that you'll continue to revisit our website to, you know, join in virtual and in-person programming at, at UVM or any of the other schools that you're interested in over the next several months. Uh, we certainly wish you well. We thank you for being here today. Take care and have a great night. Thank you so much. <laughs>